Okay, good morning class. Today we have multi-voice speed building. It's 160 to 190. And so words that come out, you have Champlin Insurance. You have to my knowledge, to your knowledge. You have that's correct, appropriate, plaintiff's exhibit, photocopying. You have attachments, handwriting, November, October. Petroleum, Scattergood, Allen, Lloyd's. Backdating, Seffens, Misrepresented, Fraudulent, London Premium, Ambiguous, Vague and Ambiguous. And so that's written B long A, B S. And then you have, um, to, my, to your knowledge is T-O-U-R-J. To my knowledge, T-O-I-J. You have, um, what else let me see? Separate is Sprat. It's one way of writing it. You've got um, handwriting. You can just write H-A-N-D and then W-R-I-G, two strokes. You have um, Inbro. Insured is S-N-U-R, come back D, insured. Colleague is K L long E G colleague, and it starts at 160. It's in the middle. Question by Mr. Munn. I believe it's always Mr. Munn's witness, unless you have Mr. Weinstein speaking to either Mr. Munn or the witness. I am Mr. Munn, the witness. Mr. Weinstein, Mr. Munn, the witness. Mr. Weinstein. No. Oh, I think everybody <laughs> sounds like a. You don't think the apple cider? I don't think it sounds like a little forest snow. Was it allergies? Maybe. Or for your sinuses? Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt. Uh -huh. All right. Okay, you all. This is 160. Starts with myself asking the witness questions. Nobody has purported to try to cancel this Champlin insurance for any other reason. Than non payment of premium, right? To your knowledge. To my knowledge, that's correct. And Champlin did pay the appropriate premium billed to us in the amount of $325,000 gross, right? Yes. And Plaintiff's Exhibit 20 is also from your files. Who sent this and what is it and when is it dated? There must have been something wrong with photocopying. The cover page has nothing to do with the next page. That's your testimony. I'm telling you that. The second page doesn't show that it was faxed. The only reason I say that is that I put the package together and I specifically recall that being a separate note. I noticed that your numbers on them are 98 and 99. Sure. It's very possible that the first page had no attachments to it. They're not stapled together. You put the clip together. No, they were stapled when I got them. They're clipped now. That's because I ran out of the staples. Would you accept a clip instead of a staple? This isn't something I've ever seen. Page 99 down in the lower right-hand corner of the document from your file marked Plaintiff's Exhibit 20 is a handwritten something. Do you know whose handwriting that is? That's my handwriting. You've seen it, have you not? Yes. Sir? Yes, I've seen it. When did you write that, Mr. Garage? It's not dated. I would have to say October, end of October, 1st of November. Of 1986? Yes. To whom did you write it? To the file. It is entitled Champlin Petroleum and your explanation begins 
This premium was written for $750,000 and represented to the insured and broker for $325,000. The coverage was for $5 million, X $15 million. Do you see that language? Yes, I do. The insured there is whom? Chaplin Petroleum. And the broker is whom? Emmett and Chandler. On down, in defending on this paper, your Inbro former colleagues, you state in the paragraph which you numbered one, Inbro claims that they advised ENC very clearly that the premium was $750,000 and have evidence that they notified them in the way of a fax. Do you see that language? Yes, I do. Have you ever seen that so-called evidence? No. Who made that claim on behalf of Inbro? Alan Scattergood. To whom? Emmett and Chandler. How did you know about it? Alan Scattergood told me. Was there ever any claim by Scattergood that he notified Champlin of any such thing as that? No. Looking further at your handwritten note, which is part of Plaintiff's Exhibit 20, your paragraph number four says Lloyd's underwriters should be able to backdate coverage at the right premium. What did you mean by that? Mm. Well, based, I meant that Lloyd's should be able to fix the problem by backdating the coverage because the coverage was on a claims made basis and on the basis of a warranted no known or reported losses at this level of excess. Unless there was a major catastrophe, there wouldn't have been a claim and charge the appropriate right premium for the risk. By that, of course, you meant the appropriate premium represented the Champlin $325,000 for the year, right? Or closer to that, yes. In other words, Stephens wanted another $325,000 for that coverage. Did it not? This quotation assumes that the $325,000 can be recovered from London underwriters based on the fact that the, either the application was fraudulent, the terms were misrepresented, or any other but basically on the basis that it was a fraudulent representation. All right. Champlin had already paid the $325,000 premium. You know that, don't you? Yes. You were proposing new coverage backdated for another $325,000, right? Yes. Who was supposed to pay that? That proposition would only work if the coverage was flatted out by London and the premium was returned. Did Inbro or any one of your group attempt to get London to flat out the coverage and return that premium? I'm going to object to the question as being vague and ambiguous. It bothers me when you refer to your group and Inbro. If you are referring to John Garage, John Garage and Company, if you could just identify who you're talking about, I would appreciate it. Did anyone, to your knowledge, on behalf of any of the people who participated in selling this insurance to Champlin, ask the underwriters at? And so you have um, participated is P A R P, P A R P. Come back, final D. You have. Um, I wrote application is P L I X with an asterisk. Catastrophe is K-A-T-A-S asterisk and then F long E. And then colleague is K-L long E-G. Appreciate is P-R long E-R-B-T. P-R long E-R-B-T. Um, you've got mm, language, lang, L-A-N-G, wish. No, W-A-J, okay, Lang W-A-J, and this will be at 170. Nobody had purported to try to cancel this Champlin insurance for any reason other than non-payment of premium, right? To your knowledge. To my knowledge, that's correct. And Champlin did pay the appropriate premium bill to us in the amount of $325,000 gross, right? Yes. And Plaintiff's Exhibit 20 is also from your files. Who sent this and what is it and when is it dated? There must have been something wrong with photocopying. The cover page has nothing to do with the next page. That's your testimony. I'm just telling you that. 
The second page doesn't show that it was faxed. The only reason I say that is that I put the package together and I specifically recall that being a separate note. I noticed that your numbers on them are 98 and 99. Sure, it's very possible that the first page had no attachments too. They're not stapled together. You put the clip together. No, they stayed stapled when I got them. They're clipped now. That's because I ran out of the staples. Would you accept a clip instead of a staple? This isn't something I've ever seen. Page 99, down in the lower right-hand corner of the document from your file marked Plaintiff's Exhibit 20 is a handwritten something. Do you know whose handwriting that is? That's my handwriting. You've seen it, have you not? Yes. Sir? Yes, I've seen this. When did you write that, Mr. Garage? It's not dated. I would have to say October. End of October, 1st of November. Of 1986? Yes. To whom did you write it? To the file. It is entitled Champlin Petroleum and your explanation begins. This premium was written for $750,000 and represented to the insured and broker for $325,000. The coverage was for $5 million, X $15 million. Do you see that language? Yes, I do. The insured there is whom? Champlin Petroleum. And the broker is whom? Emmett and Chandler. On down in defending on this paper, your Inbro former colleagues, you state in the paragraph which you numbered one, Inbro claims that they advised ENC very early that the premium was $750,000 and have evidence that they notified them in the way of a fax. Do you see that language? Yes, I do. Have you ever seen that so-called evidence? No. Who made that claim on behalf of Inbro? Alan Scattergood. To whom? Emmett and Chandler. How did you know about it? Alan Scattergood told me. Was there ever any claim by Scattergood that he notified Champlin of any such thing as that? No. Looking further at your handwritten note, which is part of Plaintiff's Exhibit 20, your paragraph number four says, Lloyd's underwriters should be able to backdate coverage at the right premium. What did you mean by that? Well, based, I meant that Lloyd's should be able to fix the problem by backdating the coverage because the coverage was on a claims made basis and on the basis of a warranted, no known or reported losses at this level of excess. Unless there was a major catastrophe, there wouldn't have been a claim and charge the appropriate right premium for the risk. By that, of course, you meant the appropriate premium represented to Champlin $325,000 for the year, right? Or closer to that, yes. In other words, Sethens wanted another $325,000 for that coverage, did it not? This quotation assumes that the $325,000 can be recovered from London underwriters based on the fact that the, either the application was fraudulent, the terms were misrepresented, or any other but basically on the basis that it was a fraudulent representation. Champlin had already paid the $325,000 premium. You know that, don't you? Yes. You were proposing new coverage backdated for another $325,000, right? Yes. Who was supposed to pay that? That proposition would only work if the coverage was flatted out by London and the premium was returned. Did Imbro or anyone of your group attempt to get London to flat out the coverage and return that premium? I'm going to object to the question as being vague and ambiguous. It bothers me when you refer to your group and Inbro. If you are referring to John Garash, John Garash and Company, if you could just identify who you're talking about, I would appreciate it. Well, did anyone to your knowledge on behalf of any of the people who participated in selling this insurance to Champlin asked the underwriters at Lloyd's or proposed to them that they return Champlin's $325,000 premium so you could place the coverage elsewhere retroactively. Not to my knowledge. Is this the only lawsuit arising out of the activities of Underwriters Marine Services or John Garage? Or what's that fellow's name, Jack D that is now pending? Okay, and so we have... Um, Words that came out, you have warranted is W-A-R-N-T, W-A-R-N-T, come back final D, coverage is K-O-V-R-J, one stroke, appropriate is P-R Longo P-T, retroactively is R-E-T, come back R-O, and then A-K-T, come back T-I-V, come back L-I, retroactively.
And this will be 180 for five minutes, you all. Nobody has purported to try to cancel this Champlin insurance for any reason other than non-payment of premium, right? To your knowledge. To my knowledge, that's correct. And Champlin did pay the appropriate premium billed to us in the amount of $325,000 gross, right? Yes. And Plaintiff's Exhibit 20 is also from your files. Who sent this and what is it and when is it dated? There must have been something wrong with photocopying. The cover page has nothing to do with the next page. That's your testimony. I'm just telling you that. The second page doesn't show that it was faxed. The only reason I say that is that I put the package together and I specifically recall that being a separate note. I noticed that your numbers on them are 98 and 99. Sure, it's very possible that the first page had no attachments too. They're not stapled together. You put the clip together. No, they were stapled when I got them. They're clipped now. That's because I ran out of the staples. Would you accept a clip instead of a staple? This isn't something I've ever seen. Page 99 down in the lower right-hand corner of the document from your file marked Plaintiff's Exhibit 20 is a handwritten something. Do you know whose handwriting that is? That's my handwriting. You've seen it? Have you not? Yes. Sir? Yes, I've seen it. When did you write that, Mr. Garage? It's not dated. I would have to say October. End of October, 1st of November. Of 1986? Yes. To whom did you write it? To the file. It is entitled Champlin Petroleum and your explanation begins. This premium was written for $750,000 and represented to the insured and broker for $325,000. The coverage was for $5 million x $15 million. Do you see that language? Yes, I do. The insured there is whom? Alan Scattergood. And the broker is whom? Alan Scattergood. On down. In defending on this paper, your Imbro former colleagues, you state in the paragraph which you numbered one, Imbro claims that they advised ENC very early that the premium was $750,000 and have evidence that they notified them in the way of a fax. Do you see that language? Yes, I do. Have you ever seen that so-called evidence? No. Who made that claim on behalf of Imbro? Emmett and Chandler. To whom? To Emmett and Chandler. How did you know about it? Alan Scattergood told me. Was there ever any claim by Scattergood that he notified Champlin of any such thing as that? No. Looking further at your handwritten note, which is part of Plaintiff's Exhibit 20, your paragraph number four says, Lloyd's underwriter should be able to get or backdate coverage at the right premium. What did you mean by that? Well, based, I meant that Lloyd's should be able to fix the problem by backdating the coverage because the coverage was on a claims made basis and on the basis of a warranted no known or reported losses at this level of excess. Unless there was a major catastrophe, there wouldn't have been a claim. And charge the appropriate right premium for the risk. By that, of course, you meant the appropriate premium represented at Champlin $325,000 for the year, right? Or closer to that, yes. In other words, Sethens wanted another $325,000 for that coverage, did it not? This quotation assumes that the $325,000 can be recovered from London underwriters based on the fact that the, either the application was fraudulent, the terms were misrepresented, or any other, but basically on the basis that it was a fraudulent misrepresentation. Champlin had already paid the $325,000 premium. You know that, don't you? Yes. So you were proposing new coverage backdated for another $325,000, right? Yes. Who was supposed to pay that? That proposition would only work if the coverage was flatted out by London and the premium was returned. Did Imbro or any one of your group attempt to get London to flat out the coverage and return that premium? I'm going to object to the question as being vague and ambiguous. It bothers me when you refer to your group and Imbro. If you're referring to John Garage, John Garage and Company, if you could just identify who you're talking about, I would appreciate it. Did anyone, to your knowledge, on behalf of any of the people who participated in selling this insurance to Champlin, ask the underwriters at Lloyd's or propose to them that they return Champlin's $325,000 premium so you could place the coverage elsewhere retroactively? Not to my knowledge. Is this the only lawsuit arising out of the activities of Underwriters Marine Services or John Garage or what's that fellow's name, Jack D that is now pending? No. What others are? Underwriters Marine Services has sued Jack D.
Okay, and so words that come out, you have identity or identify is long I F. Fraudulent is F-R-A-U-N-T. Photocopying is quote, copy, come back, P-I, come back, G. Plaintiff's exhibit is P-L-X. Okay. And this will be at 190, you all. Nobody has purported to try to cancel this Champlin insurance for any other reason than non-payment of premium, right? To your knowledge. To my knowledge, that's correct. And Champlin did pay the appropriate premium bill to us in the amount of $325,000 gross, right? Yes. And Plaintiff's Exhibit 20 is also from your files. Who sent this and what is it and when is it dated? There must have been something wrong with photocopying. The cover page has nothing to do with this next page. That's your testimony? I'm just telling you that. The second page doesn't show that it was faxed. The only reason I say that is that I put the package together, and I specifically recall that being a separate note. I noticed that your numbers on them are 98 and 99. Sure, it's very possible that the first page had no attachments to. They're not stapled together. You put the clip together. They were stapled, no, when I got them. They're clipped now. That's because I ran out of the staples. Would you accept a clip instead of a staple? This isn't something I've ever seen. Page 99, down in the lower right-hand corner of the document, right from your file mark, plaintiff's exhibit 20 is a handwritten something. Do you know whose handwriting that is? That's my handwriting. You've seen it, have you not? Yes. Sir? Yes, I've seen this. When did you write that, Mr. Garage? It's not dated. I would have to say October. End of October, 1st of November. Of 1986? Yes. To whom did you write it? To the file. Is it titled Champlain Petroleum and your explanation begins? This premium was written for $750,000 and represented to the insured and broker for $325,000. The coverage was for $5 million, x $15 million. Do you see that language? Yes, I do. The insured there is whom? Champlain Petroleum. And the broker is whom? Emin and Chandler. On down and defending on this paper, your Imbro former colleagues, you stayed in the paragraph, which is numbered one. Imbro claims that they advised ENC very early that the premium was $750,000 and have evidence that they notified them in the way of a fax. Do you see that language? Yes, I do. Have you ever seen that so-called evidence? No. Who made that claim on behalf of Inbro? Alan Scattergood. To whom? Emmett and Chandler. How did you know about it? Alan Scattergood told me. Was there ever any claim by Scattergood that he notified Champlin of any such thing as no. that? No. Looking further at your handwritten notice, which is part of Plaintiff's Exhibit 20, your paragraph number four states, Lloyd's underwriters should be able to backdate coverage at the right premium. What did you mean by that? Well, base. I meant that Lloyd's should be able to fix the problem by backdating the coverage because the coverage was on a claims made basis and on the basis of a warranted, no known or reported losses at this level of excess. Unless there was a ma major catastrophe, there wouldn't have been a claim. And charge the appropriate right premium for the risk. By that, of course, you meant the appropriate premium represented to Champlain $325,000 for the year. Right? Or closer to that, yes. In other words, Stephens wanted another $325,000 for that coverage, did it not? This quotation assumes that the $325,000 can be recovered from London underwriters based on the fact that the, either the application was fraudulent, the terms were misrepresented, or any other, but basically on the basis that it was a fraudulent representation. Champlin had already paid the $325,000 premium. You know that, don't you? Yes. So you were proposing new coverage backdated for another $325,000, right? Yes. Who was supposed to pay that? That proposition would only work if the coverage was flatted out by London and the premium was returned. Did Imbro or any one of your group attempt to get London to flat out the coverage and return that premium? I'm going to object to the question as being vague and ambiguous. It bothers me when you refer to your group and Inbro. If you are referring to John Garage, John Garage and Company, if you could just identify who you're talking about, I would appreciate it. Did anyone to your own knowledge on behalf of any of the people who participated in selling this insurance to Champlin ask 
the underwriters at Lloyd's are proposed to them that they return Chaplin's $325,000 premium. So you could place the coverage elsewhere retroactively. Not to my knowledge. Is this the only lawsuit arising out of the activities of Underwriters Marine Services or John Garage? Or what's that fellow's name, Jack D, that is now pending? No. What others are? Underwriters Marine Services has sued Jack D. Okay. And um, I did write right hand, you all, is R final ND with an asterisk. And we'll get ready for your test. Okay, class. So now we have some proper names on your 180 multi number one. You have Lieutenant Claude Adams, God, Mr. Rorwart, Lieutenant Adams, Claude T. Adams, City of Fort Smith, Detective Lieutenant Richard Lee, Mary Pinford, Mr. Lee, Federal Bureau of Investigation, Mary, Pizza, Shakey's Pizza Parlor. East Rockford Boulevard, FBI, Pinford, Agent Chief Donalds, and it starts with the court, the witness, and colloquy, and then direct examination by Mr. Rorart, and always his witness. I am Mr. Rorart. The witness. The court. Mr. Rorart. The witness. The court. Okay. And this is going to be 180 multi number one. It does start with the court speaking to the witness, five minutes, and then direct examination by myself. Lieutenant Claude Adams, will you raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear and affirm that the testimony you are about to give in this matter is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as you so answer to God? I do. Please be seated in the witness chair. Please be sure that your microphone is turned properly so that we can all hear you. Proceed, Mr. Rowart. Lieutenant Adams, will you state your name and occupation to the court? Claude T. Adams. I am a police officer for the city of Fort Smith. Lieutenant Adams, what is your primary responsibility? I'm a detective lieutenant in charge of crimes against persons. Did you have occasion on the 29th of September 1989 to take a statement from the defendant in this case, Richard Lee, with regard to the abduction and subsequent death of Mary Pinford? Yes, I did. Would you tell us just generally, this is going to be just a little different than the way we would go through most suppression hearings. All right, Mr. Rowart, what do you mean different? I just need to establish a background as to where the questioning took place and as to why it took place. All right, proceed, Mr. Rowart. Tell us a little bit about the background of where you were questioning Mr. Lee. Prior to my questioning Mr. Lee, the police department and the Federal Bureau of Investigation were and had been working on a kidnapping for approximately 10 hours. You say <coughs> kidnapping? Yes, the kidnapping was of a five-year-old girl. All right. Was there a ransom demand made that you are aware of? Yes. According to the child's mother, she had received four telephone calls, one of them instructing her to leave $15,000 in a phone booth on the east side of town, and that if she would leave that money at that location, the child would be returned to her approximately 12 hours later, unharmed. Now, how many ransom demands were made? I know you weren't there, but... Mr. Rowart, please rephrase your question. Yes, Your Honor. Lieutenant, to the best of your knowledge, were any ransom demands made? Yes. Are you, are you referring to phone calls? Yes, I am. I believe there were four. And during the course of any of those demands, were any comments made by the person placing the calls concerning the safety of Mary too? I did not hear them myself, but I believe the gist of the tapes assured the child's mother that the child was unharmed and that she would be released unharmed if the money was paid to the party. Subsequently, Mr. Lee was apprehended. Would you just briefly describe the circumstances surrounding the apprehension? The money or <coughs> facts of money had been placed at a location where the party calling had asked the victim's mother to leave the money. Where was the location? This being at the rear of the pizza, Shakey's Pizza Parlor, which is located at 2800 East Rockford Boulevard. All right. In your own words, can you tell us about this apprehension just briefly? We had at that location two police detectives and two FBI agents. They were in secret locations. Shortly before 9 p.m., Mr. Lee and another boy were apprehended at what we call the drop zone. They had been hiding in a tree at that location. 
How long following the time when the money was supposed to be dropped were they taken out of the tree? Well, Sarah, I don't know. It was... Just give us an approximate time. Do you have any approximation you can give? It was over an hour. I do know that. I would say it was closer to two hours. And in Mr. Lee's possession was a piece of paper with a phone number? That was a bit obvious, Mr. Roark. I will rephrase that question. After you apprehended Mr. Lee, what did you do next? We searched him. We patted him down to locate any concealed weapons and we searched him generally. All right, what did you find? We found items like a pocket knife, keys to an automobile, and a piece of paper that had a telephone number on it. What phone number was that? That was the same phone number as the Pinford residence. Would you give us that phone number? Yes, it was 555-2184. Now, up until this time, what efforts have been made to attempt to locate and secure the safety of Mary Pinford? I believe they had assigned somewhere around 30 police officers and 10 FBI agents along with Agent Chief Donalds and myself, who was in the helicopter making their search. The search was implemented about two o'clock in the afternoon. Did you know where she was at the time that you began this interview with Mr. Lee? No, sir. Did you have any idea whether she was alive or dead at that time? No, sir. Did you believe Mr. Lee was the man who placed these phone calls at that time? No, sir. During the time that you were questioning Mr. Lee, did he at any time say anything that would lead you to believe that he had any knowledge of the girl's whereabouts. No, sir. He... And we have on your second 180 multi, proper names, Mr. Eduardo Cortez, Angel, and Tri-State. You have, it starts with um, Mr. Erksleben asking questions to the witness in the middle. Always Mr. Erksleben's witness, unless you have Mr. Power speaking to either one of us. I am Mr. Erksleben, the witness. Mr. Powers. Mr. Erksleben, the witness. Mr. Powers. And this will be 180 number two multi for five minutes, you all. Starts with myself asking the witness questions. You didn't go to standards and meet with them every day, did you? No, sir. Once a week, once a month? Once a week. At that time, you reviewed each employee's rating, standard, and percentages. Is that correct? That's correct. And the report was made either be it bad or be it good as to how that employee had done. I don't understand. You said that if it wasn't a warning report that was done, that a speed memo could be done or an observation form could be done. You also said it could be complementary or it could be deficit. In what period of time, sir? I'm not sure of the question. Don't ask a question. I will start over. The next week after this report, this warning report that was produced on 7-3 of 1988, the next week we don't find a warning report. Was there some other report done? It could be possible. It could be. Did it have to be? If it had been made his goal, would a report have been done, some kind of report? Yes, sir. Would that have been a speed memo or something on that order? If he made his goal, sir, it would come out on computer printout. Would a speed memo or an observation form or a warning report have been done on what the computer had said because of what the computer said? It's possible. It didn't have to be done. Not necessarily. Could a person perform less than their goal and not be given a warning? No, sir. They had to perform their goal or they would have received a warning. Is that correct? Well, warning in which text do you mean? Any kind of a warning, whether it be verbal, whether it be an employee warning report, as we see here, or whether it be a speed memo or an observation form. Not necessarily so. What else could it have been? It could be a counseling, sir. Are counseling recorded in some way? Yes, sir. Is there a form that this counseling is recorded upon? Yes, sir. What is the name of that form? Counseling forms. And would that counseling form have been kept in his personnel file? It is in the standards. It is in the standard records. Okay. Would any other report been done if a person had not made his goal? We talked about a warning report and a counseling, a speed memo, and an observation report. 
any or all of those could be done when a person did not make their percentage. Is that correct? Sir, your question? We talked about four reports now. We talked about an employee warning report. Those could be produced when an employee didn't make their goals. Is that correct? Continuously if they didn't make their goals. See, there is where you are throwing me off again. I am looking at a warning report here that says that on 7-3, his productivity performance was 49.88. You said that is for the week. Uh-huh. You said that when a person doesn't make their employee goal, that one of these could be produced. Is that correct? This warning report could be, it be produced? Yes, it could be. If this wasn't produced, perhaps a counseling report could have been done. Is that correct? That's correct. You also said that sometimes when a person does not achieve their goal, that there may be a speed memo produced. Is that correct? A speed memo to what regard, sir? Showing that the person did not achieve their goal. I did not say that. So a speed memo is not used in that way? They are used for counseling. Just answer. Is he, if he asks a question, answer it yes or no. If you can answer it yes or no. If a person doesn't make his goal, could a speed memo be produced to indicate that? Yes. Who would do the speed memo? Who would write it up? The supervisor. If Mr. Eduardo Cortez needed one done, would you do it? Or are we talking about his other supervisor, Angel? Again, I would do what, sir? Tell me what a speed memo is, sir. You write a note to somebody. You write a note to somebody. Do you ever write speed memos to the employees that have the job that Mr. Eduardo Cortez had? In reference to what, sir? To not achieving their goals. Not that I can recall. Do you ever write an observation form? Do you ever fill out observation forms? Yes, I do. An observation form with a person not making their quota, would that be notated in the observation form? By whom, sir? By you, sir. If I was... By Tri-State. If someone didn't make their goal and an observation form was filled out by Tri-State, would it indicate, would that observation form indicate that they had not made their goals? Does an observation form, we don't have an observation form here in front of us. Is that correct? Correct. Do observation forms indicate whether the people make their quotas or their goals? No, sir. They never do. Well, again, I am confused on that. Can I interject here? I am confused myself. Are you asking him whether anyone at Tri-State would use an observation form? Okay, and we'll get ready for your 160s. For 160 number one, Mr. Sims, Jane Sims, Meg, Pat, Huntsville, Alabama, Ms. Jones, and Mrs. Sims. This is... Um, Starts with direct examination by Mrs. Jones at the very beginning. Always Mrs. Jones witness unless you have uh, the court speaking to the witness, which you would have in colloquy. I am Mrs. Jones. The witness. The court. <coughs> Mrs. Jones. The witness. The court. And this is 160 number one multi four five minutes. Starts with the very beginning direct examination by myself, Ms. Jones. Mr. Sims, how many children does your present wife Jane Sims have? Six. And you are currently living with her, is that correct? That is correct. And the two children of your marriage to Jane Sims are living with you? Yes, ma'am. How big is your house? Three bedrooms. What other rooms are there? There's a living room, dining room, and kitchen. And three bedrooms? Yes, ma'am. Is one of the bedrooms made over from a hallway? No, ma'am. And how many beds are there in that home? There are two bunk beds and there's two rollaway beds and a couch. Where are the rollaway beds? One rollaway bed is on the, in the outside room that was just built on about two months ago. And one- Is that called one of the bedrooms? Yes, sir. And there's one in the bedroom right off the bathroom? Yes, sir. And how many children are there in the bedroom which Meg inhabits? There are four, ma'am. There are four children besides Meg living in that room? There are three besides her. But four children in that room? Yes, ma'am. What about with Pat? There's three. There's three other children besides her. Are any of these children that live in this house besides Meg and Pat your children? No, ma'am. Do you feel the house is clean, Mr. Sims? You mean clean? You mean is it messed up? 
Is it messed up by kids? Are there any vermin, pests, fleas, or any animals on the premises? There are, yes. We have two dogs and a cat. Does the house have roaches? Yes. Does the carpeting have fleas? It's not overrun. In which rooms of the house are the roaches? Mostly in the kitchen. Where are the fleas? In the living room. On the bedrooms too? No. I have never seen them in the bedrooms, no. Have you had an exterminator come out? No, ma'am. How long have you been in the house? Mrs. Sims has been there almost five years. Has your wife got a police record? Not that I know of, ma'am. Do you have any indication that she might have a police record? No, ma'am. Have you a police record? Yes, ma'am. Would you describe any convictions that you would include in that police record? Counselor, I need to stop you right there. Unless it's a felony, I don't think it's relevant. Have you been convicted of a felony? No, ma'am. Have you? Wait a minute. Objection is overruled. The court is interested as to the best interests of the children. Thank you, Your Honor. You may inquire further. Have you been convicted of any misdemeanors? Yes, ma'am. What have you been convicted of? Assault and battery. When was that? In 1996. Where was that? Huntsville, Alabama. Would you describe the person whom you assaulted and battered? The court's not interested in going into the details of something that happened in 1996. Your Honor, if it involved a child, would the court be interested in hearing? Mrs. Jones, I don't want you to continue this line of questioning. I don't see where it's relevant. That's why I said we're not interested in the details. Mr. Sims, while you were living with Mrs. Sims, did you ever? Which Mrs. Sims? I'm sorry, my client, the present Mrs. Sims. I believe that she was the second Mrs. Sims, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. While you were living and married to my client, did you ever strike her? Yes, ma'am. One or two times. One or two times. Did you ever strike the children? On the face? I spanked them. Yes, ma'am. With your hand? Yes, ma'am. Did you ever use any other kind of an instrument or object on them? I used to use a little paddle. A little strap? Is that what you said? A little paddle. Made out of wood? Made out of plywood. Did you ever leave any welts or bruises on the children? To my knowledge, no ma'am. I never did. Did you ever use any other instrument besides that paddle and your hand? Not that I recollect. You never did? Not that I remember. No, ma'am. Do you drink alcoholic beverages? I have had two beers in three weeks. Yes, ma'am. What about prior to three weeks ago? Prior to before my mother died, I had a beer, maybe two beers a day. Yes, ma'am. Do you think that if we asked your children who are currently living with you about your drinking habits that they would say the same thing? Do you mean if they've seen me drinking? I'm sorry. Repeat. On your 160 multi number two, you have Tri-State Employee Warning Report, Counseling Report, Mr. Eduardo Cortez, Exhibit 1, and Mr. Cooper. Starts in the middle with question by Mr. Erksleben, and uh, always his witness unless you have Mr. Powers speaking to the witness or Mr. Erksleben. I'm Mr. Erksleben. The witness. Mr. Powers. Mr. Erksleben. The witness. Mr. Powers. And this is 160, number two for five minutes starts with myself. Mr. Erksleben asking the questions unless you have Mr. Um, Powers speaking to either one of us. Do observation forms indicate whether the people make their quotas, quotas or their goals? No, sir. They never do. Well, again, I am confused on that. Can I interject here? I am confused myself. Are you asking him whether anyone at Tri-State would use an observation form as a way of communicating to an employee that they are not meeting their goal? I am just finding whether or not an observation form prepared by Tri-State would tell us this information. Would it ever do that? 
Isn't that a way of asking him, would anyone at Tri-State ever use an observation form as a way of communicating that somebody is falling short of their goals? Isn't that the question you want? That is a good question. Let's do that one. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, it would. Other than the documents that we have talked about, are there any other forms that would be prepared to show a person was not achieving their goal? I don't believe so. If I don't find in the standard records personnel file or the administrative file a document entitled employee warning report or a document entitled counseling report or a speed memo or an observation form for Mr. Eduardo Cortez for the week following exhibit one, is that fair to say he achieved his goal? When? The week after he didn't achieve his goal. No, sir. What other documents could indicate to us that he did not achieve his goal. Well, again, you are confusing me because I am just confused with your question, sir. Let's go back to it. On July 3 of 1988, it was notated in an employee warning report that Mr. Eduardo Cortez did not achieve his 60% and that you have told me is for the week prior to that ending on 7-3. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, the next week, since no warning report was issued, how can I find out if Mr. Eduardo Cortez achieved his goal? We have to look at the standards records, sir. If I didn't look at the standards records, would there also be evidence in some other files that would show either he made it or he didn't make it? No, sir. So everything is all going to be in his standards files as to whether or not he achieved his goal. That's correct. Correct. You also said that a warning report is not prepared every time a deficiency exists on the percentage. Is that correct? That's correct. And you also said that there is no way for you to tell when he went from 60% as it was on July 3 to the 70% as it was on August 7. There is no way for you to tell when he was moved up from 60 to 70. Is that right? No, sir. Well, if you do know when he went up, would you tell me when he went up from 60% to 70%? Again, as I explained to you before, sir, these goals of 60 and 70 was to help the man to help him to achieve his goal. It gave him a goal to shoot for. Mr. Cooper, we have had a chance to take a little rest. Maybe I can compose my questions a little bit clearer. I would like to know from what you, the steps are between a person who becomes a full-time employee having a low percentage and a person who is a full-time employee having an 85%. I object to the form of the question. I don't understand it. All right, start all over. When a person is hired, he has set a goal at what percent? Please, sir, when a person is hired. In what capacity? The percentage figure here. What would that be when he was hired? You don't set a goal right away. You don't set a goal right away? Do you set a goal when he becomes a full-time employee? After he is trained. What do the goals start at for a person who has just barely been trained? 85%. Okay, we will pass on that question. How many times will an employee be given a warning report before he is terminated? It could be several. Are there guidelines set forth where he can go to see how many times he would be allowed a warning report before he was fired? Again, can you explain that, sir? Was there a place where Mr. Eduardo Cortez could go? A document he could read or some other way he could determine how many times he would be warned before he was terminated? Warned as to not making his goal? Yes, sir. Where would that be? Or what document would that... Okay, you all, that concludes your test. Have a great weekend. We'll reconvene next week with um, jury charge, okay?